So our next speaker is Chelsea uh, from the Public Policy Lab in New York. Um, she's also a uh, an adjunct professor at Columbia, right? In public policy? Yes. Indeed. Okay, perfect. Um, and frankly, an old friend of RSD. So uh, I think it was like RSD7 that maybe you came, it was Italy, right? It was in Italy. Yeah, so RSD7 uh, was the first time I think I was uh, exposed to Chelsea's work. Um, and uh, really happy to bring her back. Thank you so much for coming back. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I will let you take it away. Thank you. It's so much easier to get here than to Italy. Uh, it is, but it's like kind of not as nice, actually. That is true. I, I still remember at RSD7, at the coffee breaks, they had people dispensing espresso because Italy. So I'm going to speak to you today about uh, five frames for future policy. And as Evan said, I am the executive director of the Public Policy Lab, which is located uh, in New York City in Brooklyn. Um, and we are the first uh, nonprofit design lab established in the United States specifically to do, oh, no signal. What's happened? I'm pausing my role. The conference in Italy not only had espresso machines at the coffee breaks, <laughs> but also was in the former Fiat factory. So on the roof was the famous racetrack um, from the Italian jobs. You could go up there and check that out. Um, and then across the street was an, a branch, and this is really ironic, of Italy, in Italy. So one could go and consume the foods of Italy at Italy during the breaks. Oh, look, here we are. We're back. All right, back to topic. Uh, the Public Policy Lab was the first nonprofit uh, design lab established in the United States, particularly to use uh, human-centered policy and service design approaches with and for uh, public sector partners in this country. Uh, we partner primarily with government agencies, although also from time to time with big philanthropies or non-governmental organizations who are interested in how can policy work better um, and be more effective uh, for uh, low income and marginalized populations. And that is in fact the focus of our work. When we do this work, um, what we are doing typically is service design and policy design. Uh, we are asking how is it that the use of state power can be uh, effectively deployed to generate in the end services which are more valuable and more effective for members of our society. And along the way to doing that work, we are almost necessarily also doing other forms of design work, um, product design most commonly, but additionally, we're doing change management because we are attempting to generate new things in the world. And that is going to require people who currently do things in a certain way to embrace a new way of doing. Um, we conduct research and evaluation and we engage with community partners uh, to help roll out work um, into implementation. So just a note here about how it is that we think of these partners with whom we work. We partner with large organizations that have uh, responsibility and authority to deploy products and services, to deploy policy, but really we think that we share, in essence, a common client. Um, my organization and our government partners are both have a client which is the public, and that is the frame that we bring to the work. We have done this work all across this great nation of ours, and if you are interested in knowing more, I, I point you to our website. Um, where you'll see that we have worked across a broad range of different uh, kind of policy arenas. Um, all of this I say to you really in preface, um, <clears throat> and I was, I was just at Jen Polka's talk at the Riggs Library around the corner, and Jen was doing an amazing job talking about like the rich uh, relationship between policy and implementation and the way, as Allison discussed this morning, the ways in which implementation is policy and the sort of like tactical, the necessarily tactical approach that one has to take to actually make policy live in the world. And I was having a little bit of like FOMO because I was like, oh, wow, you know, I live in the world of tactical implementation and I love it, but that is not the talk I'm giving today. 
today I'm going to give a much a different talk, which is a talk about really what are some of these big themes and some of the big concerns that emerge uh, when one does this kind of work. So I'm going to I'm I'm using you guys really uh, to help me think about some of these issues, and I hope that you will say things back to me um, about what you think about some of the things I'm about to share. So I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about the ways in which uh, policy is entangled uh, in Evan's great framing of entanglement, uh, is entangled with the individual bodies of human beings in society. And I'm going to talk about how it is that policy makers and other de decision makers inside of complex systems can actually observe that and, and recognize it. And then I'm going to propose some frames that people could internalize to use to, to observe those, those issues of entanglement when they are trying to refurbish or create new policies or new policy systems. But let me make the case first, because maybe not everyone is going around thinking all the time about the entanglement of policy and bodies. How many of you are thinking about the entanglement of policy and bodies? Okay, great, fantastic. I'm seeing a few hands, okay, good. So some of you I'm, I'm preaching to the converted and others perhaps are like, oh, I, I have yet to convince you, but I hope that I shall. So the thing about policy systems is that they're, they're particularly in a country like the United States is that they're big and they're complicated and there are lots of people involved. And as we were, as Jen was just saying, uh, you know, sometimes 90 years uh, more of, of policy cruff uh, built up around the implementation of our, our policy delivery stacks. Um, so it's easy or it is normal, let me put it that way, for policymakers to be able to operate in policy spaces without actually having a visceral sense of what it feels like to be the recipient of policy-enabled tools and services. But in fact, policy decisions made here actually get felt in people's bodies over here, like, like viscerally. And, and so let me give you a few examples of, of that and what that looks like. So on the most, let's start with the most tangible sense of that. Um, if, there's a program here in the United States called WIC, it stands for Women, Infants, and Children. It's a program so that if you are pregnant or for two years postpartum, you can receive a, a subsidy that is intended to allow you to purchase food so that you and your child um, have good food. Um, if you are going, so you would think, great, fantastic, and there's a social good. We don't want uh, pregnant people and young children to be in a condition of hunger. Um, if you are going to apply for WIC and receive WIC, the government is going to literally take your blood and weigh your body. Your actual flesh and blood will be scrutinized and measured as a precondition of you receiving that food. This is not something old. This is, uh, you can see from the WIC website, it's last updated uh, in April of this year. This is the current standard. Let me give you another example. Not just physical bodies, but also emotional bodies. Uh, we did some work a number of years ago with the Veterans Administration trying to understand how the VA could better provide mental health services for veterans, uh, particularly veterans who were dealing with uh, PTSD as an after effect of their service. And one thing we kept hearing about again and again was this form, this form that veterans had to fill out to get the VA to sort of officially certify the fact that yes, they were dealing with PTSD. And one of the things they had to do on this form was describe the traumatic events that they had experienced. And as part of that, they should name who they saw killed and wounded and maimed during that event. They should also describe what medals they received for surviving that when the people who they loved didn't. You can imagine what that felt like. And it's not just a one-time event. It's not like you just go and you get weighed once and have your blood taken once or you have to regurgitate on a form the worst moments of your life one time, when you are someone who is using social services in America, often you have to do this again and again and again. 
So we recently did some work with survivors of domestic violence, specifically focusing on how it is that they're required in, as a condition of receiving social services to tell the stories of uh, them receiving those services over and over and over again. Evan, it's dawning on me at this moment that if I'm not connected to audio, perhaps the audio I'm about to play shall not play. All right, let's see, shall we? Way I felt when uh, the things were happening to me, as if it's right now happening again because I'm constantly talking about it. How does it make me feel? How do you think it makes me feel? It makes me feel horrible. So it's not just one time. If you're someone who's trying to get domestic violence services, you may tell that story three times, five times, a dozen times, 30 times over the course of a year. And particularly, this is not just painful because you have to do it again and again and again, but you have to do it again and again and again, and it feels pointless. That process of doing that again and again, retelling that story pointlessly multiple times, of course, affects pe how people feel about the system that they're operating in. They, they don't trust the system in the same way because the system is recurrently letting them down. It's great that they have so many warnings. They, they will all try to do intake one by one. Can you just share notes? But the answer is no. For your privacy concern, I felt like I was working for him to get the paycheck. They're working. They're getting paid. And they said that they're working for me, but it's like they have a duty to fill this color, that color. Mm -hmm. Sign, I have to fill in, I have to submit. I have to submit. So I, know, I want to move on now, assuming that I've convinced you that policy is felt in profound ways in people's, in people's bodies, in people's souls. The question is, how does someone who runs a policy system, who has uh, decision-making authority over uh, some complex chain of, of policy delivery, how do those policymakers understand and feel what those end users are feeling? How do they even notice that that is what is occurring inside of their system? And even if they notice it, how do they um, make it feel clear and explicable to the people around them. So that's necessary, I think. If you're going to actually be able to engage in changing those systems, you have to have some sense that each one of the human beings who you're serving is a unique individual. Even if you can't know all of them, even if you're working in a system that serves millions and millions of people, you have to be continuously mindful of the fact that the people who you are serving are each one of them a unique individual who has value and who brings their own history, their own experiences is in their own complex context. Because the moment that you stop thinking about that, the moment that you stop feeling present in the idea that each one of those unique individuals has their own life and context and value, you begin to homogenize the users of your service. You begin to think of them as a mass of people. And when you start to think of a whole group of humans as a mass, not as individuals, then they can become superfluous. And I wanna turn here to a little bit of Hannah Arendt who, who pointed out that when you start thinking of individuals as part of a homogenous mass of humans, then there is always a, a slippery pathway toward groups of humans no longer being valuable groups of humans even being superfluous. So I think there's not just a functional requirement for people who own and maintain policy systems to think about what it feels like in the bodies of their users. There's actually a moral requirement. This is the moral requirement of entanglement if you have control over a policy delivery system. 
admit that this feels abstract. How is anyone supposed to do that on the level of the system? So I'm going to give you a, a quick tour of a heuristic that my team at PPL uses all the time, something that we call the layer cake, which is a really simplified model for thinking about what is happening when a policy is being implemented. You know, we have this idea, okay, here's government, and government is going to deliver services to the people. But of course, there's no such thing as government. Government is just a thing, a, a, a set of different layers of action from the most obvious point, which is kind of service delivery as felt and experienced by individuals, all the way down to the underlying policy, the, the legislation, the statute law that actually enables and authorizes the existence of that policy stack. And at each point in that stack, that stack is of course itself a, a fiction, an imagination created by human beings and enacted by human beings. So what the government actually is, is a whole set of different individual humans acting at these different layers. Now, at each one of those points in the layer cake, members of the public have ways of interacting with those people from, again, the sort of obvious usage of tools and services at the point of delivery to the, you know, lamentable town hall where, you know, people come and yell at their elected officials to actually going to the ballot box and voting. There, there are mechanisms for the public to engage with people who are operating inside of government. And at each one of those points, there also are um, tools and products that can be uh, developed and delivered um, to improve the way that those systems work. So what we often say is that each one of these points of interaction in a system is a point at which we can design things. But additionally, um, each one of these points is a point at which you can notice whether or not uh, there are feelings being felt in the bodies of the public, which you as somebody who has authority over a system should be noticing. Now, I'm not saying here that the government has never noticed this, and I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about burden here. That the idea that you know, the government has said, yeah, I got it, sure. There are burdens for people on interacting with systems. Um, and you can see on forms like this, that this is the VA form I showed you earlier. Um, there's a, an awareness that it's gonna take time, that there will be a time cost uh, extracted from the member of the public who's filling out this form. But Hugh Dubberley and some of his colleagues a number of years ago came up with a really great way of describing all of those other costs that they called a bio cost, which is that it's not just time which is extracted from people. It is also physical effort and cognitive effort and emotional effort. And those expenditures of physical and emotional and cognitive effort occur across the duration of time. And he has a great kind of little framing here he does of trying to how to think about those costs and how they're extracted, um, which is super useful. And I would actually extend it to say, there are ways of measuring that, of noticing those extracted costs that go beyond uh, the quantitative measurements of that cost and also to the qualitative subjective experience of those costs. It is not just that the cost is extracted, it's how you feel about the cost being extracted from you. So I wanna just propose here, this is a, as a thought experiment, I'm not actually proposing that the VA redesign this form in this way, but like you could imagine a version of this form that tries to name some of that. For sure, the time demand is listed but also the energy demand and the attention demand and the level of emotional demand that filling out this form requires. Or maybe you could go a little farther. You could actually try to capture here a little scale of, of what those uh, levels of demand feel like and what they're based off of. Or maybe you could even take the example of the drug facts label, which is created, and you could provide some warnings that would help people understand what they're getting into when they're about to fill out this form. So I, I show you these design fictions just to say, we are capable of noticing and we are capable of documenting the impact of policy on the body, but we haven't chosen to do so. This slide is just a note to myself to say something to you also, though, about ambiguity. 
this is a, the internet tells me that this is the icon that means ambiguity. There is no one experience of that form. Some people are gonna fill out that form and it's gonna be horrible for them. Other people are gonna fill out that form and it's not a problem. Like there are, some people will have gone through the trauma of that experience and they will carry that trauma in their body. Other people will have had the exact same experience and will not walk away from it carrying trauma. People are incredibly variable and the experiences they have with tools and systems, even when experiencing the same tool and system are incredibly variable. So a reminder to all of us is that we have to be attentive, but again, we have to be attentive to the variability in human experience and even the ambiguity that is of a single human. Maybe today I feel great. I slept well, I had a lovely breakfast, I'm here on this beautiful day, things feel good. Maybe tomorrow I have a horrible day. Everything feels hard and painful and I cry. You know, like even within the same human being, we are not the same from day to day. But our systems are not set up to contemplate that kind of ambiguity in human experience. And yet it's what we all live all the time. So I want to tell you, um, I want to propose to you uh, a framework here, some frames that people could internalize for thinking about, thinking about how to think, thinking about how to think about the way that policy feels on the level of the individual. And with all frames, these are not solutions. It's not like you're like, oh yes, there's a frame, and now we can make a worksheet. We fill out the worksheet and now our work is done. No, the, the, the point of a framework ideally is as like a sharp stick that you poke your brain with. It's a thing that helps you think more so that you can then, and do that contextually. So that, that's my little caveat about frames. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on some great, uh, an oldie but goodie of mid-century, social theory, French and Raven's theory of, of power and the ways in which power can be exercised. And if you're not familiar with this, the basic theory is this, like when we say power is being exercised, how is the power being exercised? Uh, the power could be exercised through coercion. A system could compel you or coerce you into acting in certain ways. Or a system could try to get you to act a certain way by rewarding you, giving you incentives for doing certain kinds of things. A system could cloak itself in legitimate power and have the expectation that you recognize that legitimate power and will respond to that. A great example of this, I think, is like the librarian at the library. The librarian says, shh. And you respect, it's the librarian in the library. You are going to do what they have asked you to do. There's expert power. I'm not a doctor, but I'm going to tell you I am right now. Eat your vegetables. You know, like you can cloak yourself in the authority of expert institutions. You can say, you know, believe me because of my expertise. And then ultimately the, the sort of strangest and most interesting of these I think is referent power. The idea that, that someone through their charisma or through their ability to be convincing can get other people to act as they act or they tell them to act. So we now have an entire social media universe built on this concept that certain people are capable of being influential to other people, even though they have no actual, they have none of these other forms of power, but purely on the basis of their influence, they can get other people to act in certain ways. So I'm gonna take a little detour here into an example of some of these forms of power being exercised in the real world. Um, some of you may remember the story of Jasmine Headley, who in I think 2018 uh, went to a social services office in Brooklyn to understand why it was that her childcare subsidy 
uh, which was paying for her son's childcare. And, and because of that childcare subsidy, she was then able to go and, and work her job because her son was in care. Her childcare subsidy had been cut off for no reason that she could understand. So she went to a Brooklyn social services office to um, try to figure out why her childcare subsidy was not being paid. Uh, it was a crowded waiting room, uh, a lot of people waiting. She waited for hours. Mind you, she had her one-year-old son with her. Any of you who have ever had one-year-olds, you can imagine what it's like trying to keep a one-year-old entertained in a stroller for multiple hours in a government office. There was no place for her to sit. So she took the stroller over and like put it against the wall and she sat down next to it. But after a while, a security guard came over to her and said, you can't sit here. You're blocking the fire exit. I think we've all had the experience in our lives of being subject to uh, legitimate power being used illegitimately. That led to an exchange of words. And then eventually the security guard called the police and had Jasmine, Jasmine Headley arrested and her son was taken away from her. I'm gonna show you some video of what that moment looked like. This is really a truly horrible video. So if anybody doesn't wanna watch this, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't understand it. Indeed, it is distressing. might need these trees after that, just for a minute. Back to Hana. So I show you this not just to torture you or to make you complicit in that treatment of one human by other humans. But to come back again to this idea that we have to have ways of inventing new kinds of policy and service delivery, ones which are much more profoundly interested in what it feels like to be a human being who is being served, served by a system. So I'm gonna take this French and Raven framework and I'm just gonna engage in a little bit of imagination with you, imagination of the future. And because we live in this strange new world, I'm actually going to have imaginary pictures for you of what that might look like. These frames that I'm proposing here to you are ones that I would hope that policymakers could use when they're thinking about all of those points of service delivery that they control. They could ask themselves questions like, what kind of coercive control am I going to allow my system to use? What mechanisms for actually grabbing the bodies of other people will I allow my social service office to have? Or what if, as a thought experiment, I turned that around in my head and said, what if we allowed our service users to exercise coercive control? What if Jasmine Headley had been handed a taser when she walked into that office that she could use if anyone bothered her? Yeah, right? It's crazy and weird and uncomfortable to think that way because we don't allow citizens to have that kind of power against the state. What if she had been assigned her own security guard to keep her safe? What kinds of reward is my 
policy or system going to use? I mean, in this case, Jasmine was receiving this really valuable thing. She was getting subsidized childcare. That was worth a lot of money in New York City. She was being, she was incented to come and wait around in that office for three hours sitting on the floor because of the value of the benefit that was being delivered to her. What if the people who worked in that office were only paid if the people who they served thought that they did a good job? What if Jasmine actually had control over the salaries of the people there? What kind of legitimate power are you going to allow your system to, to exercise? Like a bunch of people in that social service delivery system had been um, given authority. Like security guards were given the authority to call the police. And the police had the authority to arrest that mother. What kinds of legitimate authority could you create for the users of that service? How could they have you know, been cloaked with some power of the user that would have been respected? What kind of referent power could the people in that system have? What if there was a TikTok account for best social service workers doing their dances, the dance of really wonderful case management. I mean, in fact, in the end, the only reason why Jasmine Headley got a $600,000 payout from the city of New York was because someone filmed that arrest and put it up on Facebook. Like she actually used her referent power to receive some recompense, but that's a, that's a bad way to get the system to work, you know? What you want is something more like this. You want something where the individual user is understood to be the expert on their own experience and their own needs, and that that is profoundly valued by the system which is serving that user. So I'm gonna end there. And you can tell me what you think. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, we're gonna do something a little bit different for a few minutes. So instead of going directly to Q&A, uh, Emily Tavlarius, who uh, is the director of our Tech and Society Initiative, is going to uh, do a little moderated uh, question session with Chelsea. Um, these two guys are old friends, so they've got some good rapport. I feel a lot of that in my own body, <clears throat> having done research that um, Chelsea was very much a, a part of at the VA. Different scenarios, very real. Uh, that was 10 years ago. I still feel it in my body. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Chelsea, I want to start with this potential entangled policy future that you describe. And I'd love to hear if, to, to better understand if you think this is something that can occur within our existing system, or do we fundamentally need to reimagine things from the ground up, or maybe something in between? But how do you think about that? I mean, I think it has to happen within our existing system because I don't think we're going to wake up tomorrow with a new system. Um, and I think that the, the nature of systems is that they are incremental. So we have to be able to create change on an incremental level. I mean, I think two, two things that ha should happen to make this more viable. One is the ability to operate at multiple different time scales. I feel like so often those of us who are really working on trying to improve policy delivery systems, we are absolutely like caught up in the problem of now. There is like bad suffering is occurring right now. So let's make a thing that deals with that. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still getting over a cold. 
it wasn't even like a glamorous COVID kind of infection. It was just a cold and yet it's still with me. Um, so there's, and then there's kind of like far out thinking about, oh, let's do this transformative thing. But I feel like we're not good at simultaneously working at multiple timescales on the same problem. What are we doing for now? What are we doing for three years from now? What are we doing for nine years from now? What are we doing for 20 years from now? And trying to move forward simultaneously on all of those. Um, so that's one thing that I would love to see change. And then the other thing I think um, has to do with a willingness to actually engage with some of this ambiguity, some of this mess, some of this, you know, corporeal mess, which we are all walking around in and with. Like I, I was saying to you when we were talking recently that I feel like this is actually part of the huge attraction to technology. And technology is the solution for the problems of government service delivery. Technology is clean. We can get away from the body. We don't actually have to touch all those poor bodies with their problems. We can just make better websites. But those bodies are still there. It reminds me of something uh, Jen was saying mm -hmm. earlier too about sort of the, the essentially the outsourcing of risk. And when we talk about like, we're managing risk and she's like, no, you're not managing risk. You're just moving it over here. You're putting it somewhere else. Um, so a lot of what you talked about today really for, like for, for me stood out as this, this gap um, and gap on, gaps on many levels. Um, but this gap between the government and the public, um, policy people and the people they serve, uh, policies and the outcomes that are intended and never achieved on many, um, on many levels. And I think the words that you used were the, 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 how removed policy people are from the individuals their policy efforts most directly affect. And I know you've done a huge amount of work bringing design principles and methods into government. So pulling me back into your practitioner brain. Um, can you share a bit about the role design plays in closing that gap? I mean, on the most sort of like obvious and explicit version of that is that when one conducts qualitative design research, you you collect the voices of people, some of those that I played for you today. You actually collect evidence of what people's lived experience is. And you can bring that evidence into rooms full of policymakers. And I, I just wanna say, like most of the policy people with whom we work are super smart, super well-meaning, not dismissive of the lived experience of the people who are affected by their policies. And even know, conceptually, obviously, that there are these challenges and burdens inside of the system. But that conceptual knowledge doesn't necessarily translate into uh, the sense of urgency that you would feel if there was someone suffering on the ground in front of you. Like you would have a different feeling about that than you would if you're just conceiving of it abstractly. Um, and it is very hard within the constraints that people are operating to be able to remain present in that all the time. Um, so one thing that a design approach can do is actually bring evidence of and reminders into the room where policy is being made. I think the other thing that design is based in is actually creative imagination. Like a design process is a process of invention. It is a process of taking some input from the world and inventing some new non, not necessarily linear response to what you took in. You're not simply distilling something, you're synthesizing it in a way that you actually generate something which is different. And that I think is a very helpful skill for policymakers and not one tragically that many policy schools be uh, focusing. Quant, 
want, want, want. Uh, can you say a bit about the, uh, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here because this was not part of my <laughs> planned remarks, uh, but I know you're, <laughs> that you're working with the city of New York mm -hmm. um, on uh, sort of highlighting for them the, uh, what their relationship to this research mm -hmm. and to bodies of work that come out of this um, these kinds of approaches and methods. Can you say a bit about that? Because I think it's really, um, I think it's really powerful mm -hmm. and really interesting to consider the role of the, the state and institutions mm -hmm. um, in relation to this kind sure. of work. I was telling Emily that I have a, a little like side problem that I'm trying to generate, uh, which is that we persistently, we do research with many different government entities. Much of our work is with the city of New York because we're based there, but we have run into the same problem working with many different jurisdictions where uh, the nature of the contractual relationships um, between an independent not-for-profit organization like mine and the government entity is the government asserts ownership over all of the product of the work. But there are problems there. If we are going to go and do qualitative research with members of the public and also with the frontline providers of government services and also with folks all up and down that stack of policy delivery in operational roles and learn from them honestly about their experiences and their needs and their aspirations, we're going to hear a bunch of stuff. That stuff is, is raw. It has people's personally identifiable information embedded in it. It has people's personal stories. Um, what I always assert to our government partners is they should not want to own that. In fact, ethically, you know, there's an ethics expert in the room, they can't own it. Like, I'm going to tell people that I am not going to essentially betray them to the system that they perceive to be causing their suffering or betray them to their employer who they feel is putting them in an impossible situation. I can't turn around and actually provide the raw recordings of those interviews to the government agency that I am essentially doing research around. Um, so the conversations that I am trying to start with the law department of the city of New York, pray for me if you are a praying person, um, is, is how do we actually engage in doing this work with and for government without government asser asserting ownership over it because that ownership is um, is inappropriate. Uh, so this last question and uh, and then we'll open it to the to the room. Um, a, a theme at least to my mind between yesterday and today, like a, a, a question I had in a number of the, the talks yesterday and today relates to a tension I am perceiving between um, like with scale and urgency. So doing this kind of work in tension with the scale and urgency that is often felt in government and government institutions. So you, you mentioned this earlier that uh, in a government institution, very often there's a sort of, there's time pressure. And that time pressure can come from any number of things. There's an election coming up, there's a particular deadline, funding is gonna run out for something. But like, we need to make a decision, we have to make it now or in three weeks. Anyway, you get the point. Uh, doing this kind of work is extraordinarily time intensive and high touch. So in other words, you know, you're you're going deep and the value is in like is in the immersion, it's in the depth of experience, it's in the connection, in all of that soft, smushy stuff that's really hard to quantify and put into giant data sets that, you know, policy people can crunch. Um when we did this work at the VA, I have this just like uh, vivid memory of uh the executive layer of the Department of Veterans Affairs and even the White House being so excited and saying, this is great. We want you to do more of this and we want you to do it all over the agency. Can you do it in like before the end of the administration? Everywhere. We're like, no, um, but I'm glad you're excited. <laughs> <laughs> Baby steps. Um, 
so I wanted to put that out there and see how you think about it. To, you know, bringing it back to the the practice and what it takes to for policy people to do this and bring it into their organizations. How number one is this a real or imagined tension? <laughs> um, and if it is real to some degree, how do you think about that tension? Sorting out my thoughts, I have like three <laughs> different bubbles about this. Um, well, let me say a, a first thing, which is that as, as many people have said, this is not my idea, this is your idea, this is Jen Polka's idea, this is many people's idea, um, <clears throat> there's a huge risk in not doing this work. Like when you design policies and services without engagement with or regard for the lived experience of the people for whom you are attempting to develop that policy or service, your service is not going to be as good. And in fact, it may fail spectacularly. So some investment of effort to actually understand your users' needs um, seems like a, a good investment. It is a valuable investment. Um, so, so invest away. Um, I think in terms of time, I mean, ideally, we would stop thinking of this work as being projects where we're gonna do a project to understand a thing and the project will take four months or 12 months or 24 months and then the project is over. I mean, ideally, it is just the work of doing the work. You are continuously engaging with the people who you are serving to understand what they are experiencing around a whole range of things. There is just a continuous, you know, think, think go back to the technology um, model here. It's not like anyone says, let's turn on the web stats for six months and then turn them off. No. But contracts operate that way. <laughs> Continuously monitor the use of your technology platform to observe what is happening in it. Similarly, continuously monitor the experience of your of the humans who are interacting with you to understand what it is they are feeling, seeing, doing, experiencing. Um, that would be the way to operationalize it, I think, that gets out of the problem of, oh, we have to launch the thing, do the thing, shut the thing down. And then, oh, look, we have to launch a thing and do a thing and shut it down again and again. Yeah. And this is where, you know, technology and um, how how effective products and services are designed and delivered can be a really useful, I think, forcing function for thinking differently operationally in those continuous loops. Because as those of you who design and develop, uh, you know, software products know, you know, the product is never done, right? You don't create it and then it's it's over. It, you are designing, you are developing, you are monitoring in these continuous cycles of continuous everything, continuous research, continuous monitoring, continuous deployment. And there's something about that that I think is very analogous to what policy, how policy should operate. So there's, there's an interesting, you know, the, the technology is clean and plays this sort of problematic role in all of this. But also the the approaches to doing it in a way that do consider the lived experiences of people might be an interesting right. uh, sort of forcing function for for breaking out of that question mark. I think um, I, yes, I think that one can one can uh, leverage the star power of tech based innovation and twist it to more human ends if one wants. Um, I think the other thing is to come back to product versus people. Like, where do these products come from? The products come from people. Who, what is the government again? The government is just people doing stuff. So I think that in as much, as, like, in as much as we can convince the people to actually perceive differently, then products will start coming out differently. So that's why I give a strange talk like this. 
because if only the people in these, this room walk out of here thinking more about that tangible experience of policy in the body, then, you know, someday when you're running a government agency, hopefully you will remember that moment, you know, and like there will be in the minds of the people who are doing the work, different kinds of questions about what they're doing and for whom and how. Excellent. Well, I have, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to open it up to questions. I, I could continue asking her questions for another like three hours, but I'm sure you will have questions as well. Um, thank you, Chelsea, again. Thank you. And let's, uh, let's open it up to yeah. the room. This thing on? Yeah, I think it is. we can like scoot closer to the mic. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Angelcia. Thank you so much um, for this presentation and very, very real, um, you know, impacts there. And I think my question has to do with that continuous cycle, um, which is so interesting where you would go out and see an experience, build for that experience or, or or avoid an experience. Um, but I'm curious about the measurement of that impact, which also mm -hmm. happens to be quantitative. And even in product, we still go to quantitative when we get qualitative feedback. It's either an emoji or it's a, a satisfaction measure. Um, how can we avoid quantitative altogether? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you know, now that we have data science, we can even measure sentiment, um, which by the way, has a range from disgust to sadness to fear and joy. How does a computer calculate my joy? You know, and, and when I'm conducting an interview and I have the script and I'm gonna run that, I'm not saying I will, but um, the possibility is there. Now we're trusting machines to process maybe even bigger, qualitative feedback. So um, that aside, I kind of digress, but I am curious about um, how can we just go straight to qualitative and especially when we start measuring impact, the outcome of a policy? I wish I had like the perfect answer to this question. Um, I don't. Other than to say, um, well, here's the thing. We all live in, with narrative, right? Like narrative is actually what seizes people, what moves people. You know, when the president stands up there and gives a State of the Union, what happens? There are stories. People are pointed out in the balcony. This guy, he had this thing happen to him. You know, like everybody knows, politicians know, advertisers know that what is actually compelling to people are our stories. Um, so one, you have to lean into that and believe that, that what you can do is you can tell stories and that those stories will be actually what is powerful for the people who are hearing your stories. And yet, and again, this maybe comes back to people's aversion to, to mess, people's aversion to ambiguity and confusion and feeling, which is nobody wants to admit that they just got persuaded by a story. It, it feels a lot more proper. Oh, look, I'm a thoughtful person assessing the data. You know, like, so if you can, if you can tee up your story with some sort of quantitative framing, then that gives cover to everyone to actually then believe your story and have feelings about your story. So I'm going to do the really radical thing and say mixed methods approaches. I'm going to, I'm going to pile on um, and share. So my students ask me about this a lot um, because, you know, design research is a tough, it's, it's not quite peer verifiable. It's, you know, it's a little, it's, shouldn't even necessarily it should not be. even shouldn't necessarily be right it's it it serves a different purpose um and where i've sort of landed is that in especially in the policy realm 
because I teach at a policy school. That's the, that's the world I'm living in right now. Um, what I've landed on is I think it's almost like a helpful gut check in some ways, because if you're doing quantitative research, which they will do, that is not changing. Meet people where they are. Um, if you add some design flavored research and the outcomes of that are in like direct opposition to what numbers are telling you, that's a giant red flag that requires more exploration to my mind, right? So if what you're seeing in a lived experience is counter to what data is saying, who's probably wrong in that equation? <laughs> Probably not the person you're observing having an experience. And I'll give you a specific example, which has stayed with me six years. For I still think about this. I was I had just had twins, and I went in for my postpartum vis visits. Mind you, I had just come out of years of doing this kind of work at the VA. And I go into this office. I'm in a place. Um, and they hand me this form. That's this like postpartum depression checklist. And I was like, I'm looking at this, trying, I had tears in my eyes and also simultaneously holding back a bizarre concoction of laughter and rage. Cause I'm looking at this form and like, what the hell do you want me to do with this right now? It's like, have you had thoughts of suicide? Have you had thoughts of murdering your baby? And I'm like, First of all, even if I had, I wouldn't be checking these stupid boxes. Like, what are you hoping to accomplish with this form? And what, but what's happening? People fill out that form and they're filling it out incorrectly. It's not true. There are plenty of women who are suffering from postpartum that get that idiotic form and they get missed. Why? Because you can't assess someone's mental state from a form. You cannot do that. It requires humans. It requires something else. And this goes to the, the, the tension with scale. Like there's something about human contact that feels kind of inherently unscalable and super important. And like anything related to caretaking is at the top of that list, right? Anyone who has kids, like you can't outsource that to an algorithm. You can't see it in numbers and piling on the mixed methods, right? Like you, you kind of need both. And the question for the methods people is like, what is that? What does that look like? <laughs> Other questions? Just had a response to a very powerful experience there that maybe, maybe the goal of the form isn't assessment at all. Maybe the form is just a MacGuffin to get, Bingo. to precipitate the conversation between the doctor and the patient about postpartum depression. And if we don't delegate that moment to an object, <clears throat> then the system loses control, right? And, and like, well, we have this object, we can hang the faith that this discussion will happen in every postpartum visit on the fact that we've got a process where that form will get given, and then that will open the moment where I should, where I can talk. I'm about with it. you, and I think this is where the design research is really useful because that never happens. It never happens. That yeah. might be the intent, and I think you're right. I think that is probably part of the thought there. But what, how does policy get implemented? Is not something you can assess quantitatively. It's something that someone would have to sit in rooms and observe the patient-doctor interaction and say, oh, look, something's dropping here. We're missing something here. So I, I think it's a good example of you know, what you're talking about in terms of intent and how it... Well, each one of those, I mean, again, to come back to like, what is a product? What's a product supposed to do? I would argue that most products, and particularly products in the context of social service delivery, which is where I'm most familiar with them, should be understood as prompts for behavior. 
the intention of the tool is to create some new, I mean, go back to the framework, some new effort on the part of someone to do something. And so that tool should ideally be not just prompting a particular action, but the tool can aspire to prompt that action within a certain cognitive and emotional framework. It can make you ashamed or embarrassed or enraged that you are being asked to describe the difficulty of having just given birth to twins, or it can make you feel supported and encouraged. And like you could, if you stop thinking of it as we are going to collect some data about our patients and start thinking about it as, hmm, what sort of action are we looking for here? We are looking for our patient to feel encouraged to tell the clinician something about her experience. But again, only do that if the clinician has some meaningful way of responding. I can't tell you how many times we've talked to government partners and they want to collect feedback. I'm like, what are you gonna do with it? And how are you going to demonstrate that you have done something with it? You, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna collect the feedback, then you owe the people who you collected it from some way of knowing that they got heard and something happened. Even if what, we, what it is is we got your feedback and we decided to not use it. Thank you for uh, a wonderful uh, story. And uh, but I was intrigued, or I, I was curious. Uh, well, maybe I'll start with the story myself. The story. Uh, Great. I, so last week I was uh, taking part in the pub in uh, Norway at the Nomata Forest, and I was I found myself looking at the sun through the trees, and uh, and looking at the branch that was kind of almost ripped off of, uh, of one of those trees and it actually fell across a power line so it was as if the forest was trying to kind of uh, you know reclaim its uh, possession around the, the territory or whatever the land and then I also observed like the tiniest mushrooms that were growing on a tree that was almost about to yeah dissolve and, and return back to nature. Or maybe they weren't in conflict. Maybe they were embracing. Maybe they were just dancing with each mm. other. Um, however, one of the reflections that I got there is, is kind of, okay, so how, how, what kinds of changes do I need to um, make in my behavior to help this, this process of regeneration of the forest? and uh, natural uh, elements that I'm kind of part of, actually, uh, become more, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, increase its, uh, its pace. And, and then it, and then it make me, made me think about this kind of idea of the social contract and how we need to perhaps negotiate what our social contract is with regards to the living systems that we are uh, you know, taking part in. And so my question is with regards to speculations about the future and, and all of these wonderful uh, ideas that you've shared with us and very vividly uh, illustrated, I wonder whether you have any uh, thoughts about, um, you know, those trajectories uh, around this story that I told and the social contract and mm. the negotiation sure. of powers. I think there's a bunch of really um, thoughtful work that is being done around people who are actually saying it is too narrow for us to use a term like human-centered design. It, in fact, ignores a whole set of non-human things that also are super important and super valuable and are worthy of care and interest and intention. Um, I am not a deep of that space. I know that space exists. So I would say yes, yes to that. Um, I think the, the only, 
And this is not even, this is just a wondering or a, a worrying that I have, maybe. I feel like a lot of the discourse around our the climate emergency, which is occurring everywhere around us, is um, framed in terms of guilt or obligation or debt. It's, it's oh, the, the, the past generation let down the current generation. And if the current generation doesn't get its act together, we're going to let down the future. We're going to fail the future. And I feel like there must be some other way of conceiving of this, which isn't framed in obligation and debt and owing. I mean, I don't know that I think the past owes us anything. And I don't know that I think that I owe the future anything. So th this question of can we, can we be more attentive to the branch and the power line, but do that in some way which isn't about shame or fear and instead try to approach it from some different space of you know, joy. That was such not an answer to your question, but <laughs> it's where I go when I think about that. Yeah. Kind of that we, we consent to uh, uh, giving up some of our, our personal embodied needs for the common good. Right. Welcome to our big vaccine debate of late, right? Yeah. Um, I I don't I don't right. I I feel like this was something that 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 came up in the talk that Jen Polka gave just a, a bit ago too. Like, there's no there's no resolving these tensions. It's the whole that the whole nature of that social contract is about I am willing to give up some piece of my individual agency, my individual motivation, what purely makes me happy in order to participate in a society. And a society then has some responsibility to redistribute the goods and values of that society for the benefit of the people in the society. That is never going to be without its rough moments. So it's all about being able to say, yeah, it's it's hard to do this, but it's actually much better than totalitarianism. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> Jen Polga was saying in uh, in in this part of the conversation was uh, she was talking about trade offs and the importance of being uh, extremely clear eyed about trade-offs and being able to talk about them, which is currently like not really a thing in policy, uh, in the policy realm. It's very hard to have a clear-eyed and genuine discussion about trade-offs. Like if I want X, I can't have all of it. What are the costs? What are the results of this decision? What will they be? And she used the term um, trade-off denial, mm -hmm. I think, which I'm going to carry around with me. I love that. Um, but one question I want to put out there um, to consider in response to your question is the difference in the social contract that people have with government versus technology and companies. And that is extremely true in the United States. It's not, it's not about response to your question, but yeah. I, I think uh, one, one observation and one question. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate my question, but I might uh, rumble. It's rumble okay, it. ramble away. I think that you must enter the design point, which I, I found some of the comments by someone else was really helpful. Because I mean, there are human centered design, which is, has been criticized, but actually what kind of human we are talking about, because human has nature of self giving, you know, helping others, but also human has nature of self-centered and greediness. Mm -hmm. So whether we promoting that self-giving human or whether we are actually promoting self-centered human, that depending on what 
focus we have, our human centered design still needed, it is important kind of approach we have to take. So that's kind of a, uh, comments about human centered design. But my question is, um, there was assumption that many problems happen because of the gap of knowledge or gap of compassion between you know, different people. Uh, but whether there was, you know, even any case that people have a you know, full understanding about what's going on, but still they abuse system or they just use it for their own benefit. Uh, it's not just top down, it's all can be also bottom up as well. I mean, probably this might be easier to give some example that um, there was, I'm not a resident of South Korea, I've been working in the UK for 20 years, but there was um, some of the new law, which is about um, kind of co corporal disciplines in the school, because you know, South Korea has a kind of hard uh, culture in, in the system. So you know, the teachers tend to abuse their power to discipline their students. But then there's a new law, which means that no corporate punishment in the school, then you know, child abuse is heavily kind of potentially criminal charges, things like that. So then children start to abuse the, their power to the teacher. Then there are many cases of uh, teachers, you know, suicide, uh, su uh, you know, die by suicide. So it's not about one way, but when, when there's any power differences, then people abuse the power. So maybe citizen can also abuse power if there are too much power is given to them. I don't know what that, that kind of a situation, whether do you face. I'm gonna go off on a little tangent, but I'll, it, it will relate, I swear. I'm, I'm just gonna take you into a weird place with me. Um, I mean, fundamentally, we're all, we're animals, right? I don't, I don't mean any judgment by that. Like, we, we are animals. And sometimes I think it's useful to look at how other animals behave, to notice how we behave. And if you look at like the, the great apes, if you look at the other big smart primates, like you've got chimpanzees on one hand who are like super territorial and super violent. And the chimpanzees are constantly like going around and like mur murdering each other's ba other baby you know, chimpanzees and doing all kinds of like aggressive stuff. That is how they make their society go, is actually through aggression and violence. By the way, not a primatologist, I'm just pretending to be expert on primates up here. So if anybody in here actually knows something different about chimpanzees, just put your hand up. Um, on the other hand, there are the bonobos and the bonobos engage in constant sexual uh, behaviors and grooming behaviors. They are constantly um, getting each other sexually aroused and satisfied and engaging in stroking of one another. And that is how they handle conflict in their society. They try to handle conflict through through pleasure and by providing pleasure to one another as a way of reducing conflict. So all this to say, this is my, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop the primate tangent now, but like, like you can observe that human beings are just animals engaging in all kinds of behaviors around their feelings. And then we build systems we build whole cultures to try to control and mediate and manage our animal behaviors, right? So the, the and, and really, I, I genuinely believe that there's like 5% of human beings who are like, who are like angels and they're just really good people. And there's like 5% of human beings who are devils, you know, and they're just, they're just evil. But the vast majority of human beings fall into this great middle space where they are trying to manage their relationships to power. They're trying to manage their relationships to the people around them. They're trying to manage their relationship to themselves. And so, and all of that is what is implicit in South Korea's corporal punishment rules. It's all about how are people managing their interactions with others and then their interaction with themselves on this actual kind of pretty felt and emotional level. It doesn't have to do with rationality. We, we cloak it in some rational argument about like, I don't know how children are supposed to act or how teachers are supposed to act, but it's actually about how people feel in those moments. So as long as you act like you're designing things for robots, then you are going to get systems that don't work. 
you actually have to be able to engage in a conversation about what's the pleasure inherent in having control over a room full of children? What is the terror inherent in having control over a room full of children? You know, and like, think about that so that you can design systems that work in different ways for those contexts. Okay. One thing I want to add is um, related to the, the power and the importance of deeply understanding the people and the environment and the culture that a particular set of policies live in. Because what the answer to how to help students or teachers manage their relationships to each other and to themselves, how what will be effective in Korea is probably quite different than my own uh, my own homeland in Greece, where like the relationships between people and norms are completely different, and expectations are completely different. Um, so there is not a one size fits all solution to policy. And this I think brings us back to the importance of being connected to the people and the spaces that you're in, because the, like it's not, people are not a monolith. Experiences are not a monolith. And the, the, the challenge that we all have, especially in these massive institutions, right? The layer cake, like you think about that layer cake, is how many people, institutions are people, government is just people, how many people are in there and what it takes to snap people out of the immediate institutional needs and fires that they're dealing with. And to remember that at the end of this thing is a human. And, and I think just simply finding ways to just remind people of that is really powerful. Yeah, I mean, I think this is another one of those like impossible tensions, which is we are all of us in this room humans, and therefore we have a huge amount of commonality. We have a huge amount of shared uh, sensation of being human beings walking around alive. I, I, am, I am so close to all of you and you are so close to me. And at the exact same moment, we have had totally different life experiences. We come out of completely different cultural contexts. We have, you know, there are ways in which it will be very difficult for us to understand one another and relate to one another. And bizarrely, both of those things are simultaneously true. So this question of how we navigate, on one hand, the belief in some, you know, because I again, it comes back to like, I think you have to believe that all other humans, at least, and maybe even the trees, are all deserving of respect and care, while also believing that we are all different and shaped by our own culture and life experiences is really hard. It's really hard to do that. I'm not going to say that that is something which is simple. I mean, this is kind of what laws are for, right? Like, like the legal code is mainly interested in people who are being devils, one form or another. Although I, I think, as we talked about here, like it gets applied to people who aren't being devilish at all. They have just run afoul of some system that wants to endevil them. Um, I think so, we need to leave it there. Um, with endevilment. Yeah, yeah great. Um, uh, ending on endevilment. <laughs> um, thank you both thank so, you much. so much. Um,